What's that saying? Fortune favors the bold? Yeah, right. Lucky me. That was one of the trailers for Naughty Dog's Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, which first released in the PlayStation 3 back in 2009. I can tell you up front that I was really looking forward to doing this video because Uncharted 2 is a legendary game. Arguably one of the best sequels in the history of video games, with millions of copies sold and awards won. I mentioned in the previous video that it's been a long time since I last played any of the Uncharted games, but when thinking about the series, this is the one I would remember the most because it's such a blockbuster game. When discussing my favorite games throughout my YouTube career, this is one I usually don't bring up because of the fact that it's been so long since I last played it that I don't have an updated opinion on it, which is why we're here today. I used to play the crap out of this game back when I first got it in 2013, but that begs the question of why that is. But before we dive into that, it's important to talk about Uncharted 1 for those who might have missed the previous video. Going back to Uncharted 1, the game was pretty much as good as I remembered, but it basically stops at being a really good game. Uncharted Drake's Fortune was a significant title in that it had some of the best graphics and production values in the gaming industry back in 2007. It saw its developer, Naughty Dog, get out of their comfort zone and develop a game that was nothing like what they had achieved before. A cinematic third-person shooter bringing the action-adventure serial mold to life in a game. To this day, Uncharted is a good game. It's got a good pace, an entertaining story, and is fun to play, but it did have some issues like not having too much variety in its short runtime and having mechanics that were kind of janky at times. As I have said, the game was really good, but today I can't say it surpasses the bar of really good. You can't blame Naughty Dog for any of that too much though. It really was a time of massive change for them in the industry. I talked about the internal issues the team was facing as management shifted from the Jack era to the Uncharted era, but externally issues still cropped up, namely the PlayStation 3. I alluded to this last week. The PlayStation 3 was an absolute beast of a machine when it came out in 2006, but this was to a detrimental degree. As far as most people were concerned, Sony ruled the video game industry for 10 years straight. The PlayStation dominated the market in the 90s, having sold 102 million units. The PlayStation 2 goes without saying. Not only is it, in my not-so-professional opinion, the greatest console of all time, but it's also, at time of writing, the highest-selling console ever made with 155 million units sold. Truly, Sony was untouchable for two generations straight, so it would be logical to think that the PlayStation 3 was going to be the same way. It was ambitious hardware with the complex cell processor, its Blu-ray disc utilization, its being able to play almost all the PS1 and PS2 games alongside your new HD games, all that stuff. But Sony banked on name recognition a little too hard with this one. The PS3 infamously launched at 600 US dollars, something that Naughty Dog noted developers weren't aware of until Sony said it on stage at E3 2006. Which, by the way, it could have cost more. The original PlayStation 3 was sold at a loss, but Sony thought they could get away with it. But at launch, the market was not as kind to the PS3. I mean, the actual launch was crowded with people camped outside game stores in tents and all that. I remember my dad showing me the news coverage of that as it was happening. But the PS3 struggled with sales compared to the other consoles because Microsoft decided to get ahead of the game by releasing the Xbox 360 in 2005. It was behind on things like having an HDMI slot, but it being the first HD console to market and a far cheaper price was more palatable for consumers. The PS3 also launched alongside the Nintendo Wii, which captured the casual audience like no console had ever done before. So here you have this massive console that often got the short end of the stick in its early years. It was infamously difficult to develop for with its unique architecture, third-party games being designed for the Xbox 360 and then just ported to the PS3, so only the exclusives took advantage of what the hardware could do, which in and of itself was a learning curve for those developers and didn't always produce great results in terms of performance, and to make matters worse, America was hit with an economic recession in 2008, so I'd imagine that only made the $600 price tag of the PS3 even less appetizing for consumers. None of that is to say the original fat model is bad, I'm actually quite fond of it. It was the first PS3 I had ever gotten back in 2010, although I'm not sure what they were worth back then because I had gotten it used and this was also after the revision had come out. But that's besides the point. The PS3 was the main console I wanted because of the fact that that's where all my favorite PS2 exclusive franchises were going on. This is actually not my original fat model though because that got the yellow light of death back in 2013 and so that got trashed. This is a PS3 fat model I got myself back in 2019. But back to Sony and the PS3. 
A revision was desperately needed, which is what happened. In 2009, the PS3 Slim was released. It was a much smaller console that could do everything the original could, but with the exception of playing PS2 games, that was gutted to reduce the price tag. The Slim model launched for $300, which was much better. I only recently acquired this. I was at my uncle's house a few months ago for my cousin's birthday, and he was telling me about how he wanted to sell his PS3 to GameStop, but they didn't take PS3s anymore. I was like, if nobody wants it, I will gladly take it off your hands. So now I now own all three PlayStation 3 models. The Super Slim is uh, over there. It'll be discussed in another video. For those Jay's Reviews lore masters, this is a different uncle from the one who gave me his PlayStation 1 that I talked about a couple years ago. For those who were curious. So how does all this relate back to Uncharted? Well, Uncharted 1 proved itself to be a success. ND claimed it was not really a case of a massive marketing campaign, but rather word of mouth and made people interested because it just looked so cool. Uncharted was such a hit on such a comedy of errors console, which really says a lot about how good the game was as the first of a new IP. Naughty Dog was pretty excited to do Uncharted 2. It was the kind of thing where Uncharted 1 shipping didn't inspire the team to want to go on break. They wanted to dive in and see what they could really do now that they had a foundation to work from. Uncharted 1 was in development for over two years, but most of that time was spent simply learning how to code for PlayStation 3 and creating a new IP from scratch and figuring out how they were going to bring it to life and what kind of gameplay it would have. Sounds pretty stressful, I must say. That's the beauty of a sequel. All that hard work has already been done, so now they can assess what worked about Uncharted, what people didn't like about it, and what they'd want to do differently now that they had the time and hindsight to ask such a question, and then put their foot on the gas making the best game possible. I can go over how they did this as we go along, because the remainder of this video is going to be all about how Uncharted 2 Among Thieves demolishes expectations producing an incredible sequel and how it turned the tides of the PlayStation 3. Uncharted 2 dives right into the action as Nate finds himself shot and on board a crashed train that is currently hanging off of a cliff in the middle of a frigid mountain and he has to climb his way off the train before he falls into the abyss. This sentence alone should speak volumes on how much more action packed the game is compared to the first one. It's almost unfair to compare them since Uncharted 1 had to set up the characters quickly and effectively and to that end, they succeeded. This game, having the benefit of you already knowing Nate, can just drop you into the action and you're already hooked. The first half of the game is a flashback to get us to this point. Nate was minding his own business until an old associate, Harry Flynn, tracks him down with the help of his ally, Chloe Frazier, as needed Nate's help to bust into a museum with a treasure that will help their client, Zoran Lazarevich, find the lost fleet of Marco Polo and hopefully find Shambhala and the Chintamani stone that lies within. Nate is betrayed by Flynn at the museum and is sent to jail, only to be let out on bail thanks to the returning Victor Sullivan. The duo, alongside Chloe, who is working on both sides, plan to get the treasure before Flynn and Lazarevich, who is an utterly evil warlord. Sully just says, screw this, I'm out after one level, and then Nate is reunited with Elena from the first game, now having to navigate two love interests at once as they try to get one step ahead of Lazarevich. Bit lengthier of a synopsis this time, but Uncharted 2 is a more involved story, so it was necessary in order to bring you up to speed on all the major players in the plot so we can talk about the gameplay. Uncharted 2 improves literally everything from the first game. I mean, literally everything. Let's start with the things Uncharted 1 didn't do so well. Nate handles much better in this. While designing a game with human protagonists, you'd want the way they move to feel real. So I understand why Nate felt a little heavy in the first game, since no actual human could move around the way Jack does, for example. However, Nate running around and jumping did feel like he was wearing cement shoes or something. Uncharted 2 manages to keep that feeling of controlling an actual human being in the way Nate moves around, but it feels a lot smoother when jumping and rolling and running around. So the mere act of pushing buttons just feels better than the first game. Nate's hand-to-hand -hand combat was also reworked. Drake's Fortune had two combos, a five hit light attack combo with square and a heavy attack combo with square followed by triangle and then square again. Uncharted 2 is just mashing square till the enemy is down, but sometimes they block and try to counter and then you have to press triangle to dodge and then they can continue pressing square. On paper, the complexity of the hand to hand combat is reduced from the first game and that you have far less choice. Also less reward because a heavy combo in one gave you more ammo, but it just felt finicky with the timing. The punching in 2 is just far more satisfying, from the sound effects to the variety of animations and the window of time you get to counterattack. It just feels like an action movie fistfight come to life, which is exactly what I want from Uncharted, not to go combo mad. But having said that, Nate can do more context-sensitive physical attacks than you could in Drake's Fortune, such as if you're standing on cover when an enemy is behind it, you can just kick them in the face. Never gets old. You can also push enemies off of ledges when near them and other things like that. 
I actually tried doing the kick thing in the first game, and of course I got killed because I forgot it wasn't in the game. But then, the biggest thing I didn't like about the first game was how they would put the action on pause to do lengthy scenes of platforming or puzzle solving. Platforming wasn't bad, it just felt very basic and like it played itself. The puzzle is being simplistic, not rising above, see the thing on the page, make the thing look like the page. Now, Uncharted 2 doesn't do much to improve these elements on their own, as the platforming is still a case of pressing X and then Nate will do everything for you. But to its credit, they do include moments that require more timing in your moves. Not a supremely high amount, but enough to feel like an improvement, and they do even better with the scale and scope, playing with the camera for some perilous shots. But where I think the improvement lies is with how platforming is integrated with the pace of the game. In Uncharted 2, you'll be involved in large gunfights, but then right after you'll need to go up some buildings, and to do that you have to climb up a pipe or some beams, and then you're in the building ready for the next set piece. It feels like an organic part of the game rather than here is the next extended platforming segment. It's something you do regularly between combat scenes. Heck, sometimes it's what you do during combat. The arenas have greater verticality that is accessible to the player and the enemies, so you'll be able to use these simple mechanics in more complicated situations. During set pieces, it's even better as you'll be jumping around from rooftop to rooftop while being chased by a helicopter or a tank. Moments filled with such adrenaline that you wouldn't even be thinking about how simple the platforming actually is since you're so absorbed in the moment. But platforming is also worked into puzzle solving like this big statue in a temple in Nepal. Yes, you do just see how the statue should look in the journal, but then you have to figure out how to climb up to each part of the statue which gives you more to think about while trying to solve the puzzle. Then, they play with your expectations since you're expecting climbing to be so scripted, so they can script jump scares into it. <laughs> I don't know why, that one got me. In combat, Uncharted 2 is also a massive step up. The foundations of combat from Uncharted 1 were strong, I went into that in the last video. The dynamic of finding weapons and only being able to have two guns at a time created a lot of on-the-fly decision making which kept combat engaging. Uncharted 2 does all of that again with a roster of incredibly satisfying weapons, with new mechanics included like riot shields you pick up that only let you fire with a handgun, or explosive barrels you blow up, while making improvements to the mechanics and handling that were already there. This is harder to appreciate in 2023 due to the PS4 ports, but it should be mentioned that Among Thieves ditched all the six-axis controls from Drake's Fortune, as by 2009 it was pretty clear that the motion controls on PS3 were pretty frickin' lame. All that really means for Uncharted 2 was that grenades are now controlled with the analog stick, as is balancing on small beams. As for the act of shooting, I said Uncharted 1 made it feel kind of clunky to work with, in that the crosshairs move too fast by default, but too slow when adjusting it. In the sequel, it feels just right, and so I don't take as much damage when trying to get shots in. An improvement in the fine-tuning of aiming is just one small bullet point in a list of great things, right? But it's such a fundamental part of the experience that it pays dividends while you play, since you'll be spending a lot of time shooting and you want that to be as fun and functional as possible. Switching cover was also something that felt really off in the first game, as you'd be left open for damage while doing so. Uncharted 2 allows you to switch cover and immediately snap to the nearest one, whether that be from rounding the corner of the cover you're currently hiding behind or going between two separate ones. It might sound like a reduction in the complexity or challenge or whatever, but like the hand-to-hand -hand combat, I'm down with an improvement in the fun factor of the game. Combat encounters are just more enjoyable in Uncharted 2 because the maps you battle on just feel better designed than what you got in the first game. The previous one kept you in the moment during shooting segments, but oftentimes it felt pretty chaotic. In 2, whether enemies are above or below you, the combat maps consistently feel designed to present you with overwhelming odds, but are manageable with good strategy and getting the right angles behind cover. The maps include more of the climbing mechanics, which ties into the platforming controls, and this is put to good use because combat is far more dynamic in Uncharted 2 via its inclusion of stealth mechanics. The stealth element of the game isn't particularly complex or involved, just staying out of sight and doing takedowns and unsuspecting enemies, however it's the way this stealth interacts with combat that changes the game completely. In Uncharted 1, dedicated shooting segments didn't really give you a choice in how it was going to go besides finding weapons and such. Here, there are just so many different ways to engage a room of enemies, because if you don't get spotted, you can stealth take down several enemies and avoid having to blast through all of them. There are still some moments where it can't be avoided, but the light stealth mechanics just gives Uncharted 2 more depth when playing because the player can engage with combat encounters in a plethora of different ways you couldn't in the first game. That should keep you mechanically engaged throughout the game, but it also helps that no segment goes on too long. When editing Uncharted 1, it became pretty clear that visually the game is pretty samey throughout. You play almost exclusively in jungles and stone structures. Made it kind of difficult to mix up the footage I was showing. Uncharted 2 is nothing like that. In this one, you do a stealth mission in this high-end museum, you go through a swamp in Borneo, explore Nepal, the Himalayas, and then journey to Shambhala. Each with their own unique visual style and level design challenges in terms of platforming and shooting. 
Every area looks fantastic even to this day as well. As I mentioned way earlier in the script, Naughty Dog had a much better handle on the PS3 when designing Uncharted 2 compared to the first one. Thanks to some help from Guerrilla Games, they were able to overcome their long-standing issue with V-Sync, and then they were able to use the development time to really dive into what the PS3's cell processor could do. According to them, Uncharted 1 only utilized about 30% of the cell's power, and the sequel was shooting for 100%. We added more functionality to it so that it all could be done on the SPUs and really, really efficiently and with much higher quality than before. Our characters, um, they typically have 80,000 uh, polygons in, in you know, one character, like the main character. In total, what, you, what we try to push through to, to, the, to the graphics chip is about 1.2 million uh, triangles that we try to, to, to draw every frame. More areas, which I just went into, more animations are packed into this game, like Nate having a stealth walk or an adjusted sprint, or the various, seemingly never-ending amount of fistfight animations. Uncharted 2 is a game packed with visual detail from its physics to its gameplay to its visuals. This being the first game where the crew had decided to take the audio from the motion capture performance as the dialogue. I went back and added this blurb into the Uncharted 1 video after it was finished because I just didn't know that at the time. But what I learned when researching this video was that it wasn't until this game where they realized it would be more natural for the takes to just be from the mocap stage, giving them the ability to just mix and match which takes were the best from which actors, something a movie couldn't do quite as easily since the cuts might be awkward. Not to say it doesn't happen, but I just mean that with mocap it's easier to splice takes together since the facial animation and character models are inserted later. Speaking of which, I was actually surprised to learn a few years back that Uncharted 4 was the first Naughty Dog game to use facial capture since replaying this game. They just did such a great job with the facial work that you could have fooled me. We have to complete that performance and make these characters really alive and, you know, how their fingers and hands are, are held and what their faces, uh, the, the expressions and... Uh, and tone and emotion of their face. It's not just the lip sync, it's, it's, the, it's the whole performance. It's what they're doing when they're not speaking as well. Everything from the gameplay to the graphics of Uncharted 2 keep you hooked on it throughout, getting you to the most exciting part of the game, its action set pieces. It's funny how this series is known for its explosive action, but when you replay the first one, it's interesting to see how little of that is in the game. You got the jeep chase and the jet ski, and that was basically it outside of tiny moments like this part in chapter two where you have to sprint through these crumbling beams. Among Thieves just saw that and was like, nah, we can do better. This game has enough crazy set pieces to fill an entire franchise of action movies. Like being in Nepal and getting chased from rooftop to rooftop by a gunship that's blasting the roof you walk on to pieces. Or when you get to this building and the chopper is trying to bury Nate and Chloe by shooting the building with missiles. You're running around this room while the building is plummeting to the ground. <laughs> We were, we were almost in that. <laughs> Not everything is that explosive. Sometimes it's just chase scenes, of which there are many. A tour of this entire village as it's being invaded by the enemy army. A convoy mission where you jump from truck to truck. This game has it all, and it's so much fun to play. But the bigger set pieces like the building one demonstrate so much technical expertise from ND because they created things like a fully functioning room you run around in while it's also crashing to the ground. Or the biggest of all, the train sequence. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the make or break element of Uncharted 2 was getting this train scene right. It's the kind of thing you take for granted while playing because it's so good in the final product, but it took a lot of time and testing to create a fast moving object you can play on that feels real, but they achieved it and made a level that never lets up in terms of action. Another chopper chase, near constant explosions and cinematic angles. A bunch of different enemy types to contend with, different ledges to grab onto from each side of the train, giving the player multiple methods of approach. It goes on for like a half hour, maybe more, but you never want it to stop. It's just thrilling from start to finish. The Uncharted series needs action scenes like this because it goes together with the core gameplay loop and the series concept of being a playable action movie so well. Yeah, the first one had the shooting and a chase scene, but this one has the big summer blockbuster action scenes and it's still top notch to play almost 15 years later. But it's not overindulgent as Uncharted 2 is paced quite well. Action scenes are usually followed up with slower paced bits, and when those go on long enough, you get a really good set piece as payoff. No greater example than the train, which is the biggest action scene in the game. After that's done and you barely survive the wreckage, the player gets to cool off with a completely safe village scene, followed by a lengthy expedition of this cave with Tenzin. From there, you return to balls to the wall action for almost the entire rest of the game. Uncharted 2 is longer than the first by a couple hours, but it's the right kind of long and that it's varied and fun to replay. 
I remember one time in 2013 after school, I just decided to binge the entire game in one sitting. I don't know how I did it, but I did, and I had fun with it. It was like a personal challenge. I also had a lot of fun with the cheats menu back when I was super into playing this game. Like the various skins that you play as the other characters, or the no gravity effects cheat which me and my friend had a riot laughing at while playing. Although on that note, I never did experiment with the multiplayer. Online gaming was not, and I guess still isn't, my thing. But again, credit to Naughty Dog because in addition to making such a genre-defining campaign, the disc also included an online multiplayer that people enjoyed. Jack X had online capabilities, but this is a proper multiplayer mode in a single-player game. Can't play it anymore because the servers got shut down in 2019 and the PS4 collection only included the single player, but still. My point is that Uncharted 2 is packed to the brim with exciting content. All this wouldn't mean nearly as much without the storyline, which is also a huge leap in quality from Drake's fortune. As stated towards the beginning, it's also a little unfair to say that since that game had the burden of coming first, but it deserves praise nonetheless. The writing here is just way more compelling than the first game. Just begin with the setup of Nate hanging off of a cliff and spending the first half of the game working your way towards that point. It just adds this element of dramatic irony that wouldn't be there if the story played out in an entirely linear fashion. When Nate actually reaches the train yard, you're just thinking, oh crap, this is gonna end terribly. So while you play the train level, you're worried about what moment the train is going to fall off the tracks, literally, in addition to enjoying the high octane action. That aspect of the story was executed phenomenally. Then you get all the various characters Nate has to deal with in this one. The cast is mostly new. Sully joins you towards the end of the first act, then pieces out until the ending. Nate is reunited with Elena and works with her for most of the game like Uncharted 1. But it's Nate reacting to the other characters that ups the drama. Like how Nate and Chloe totally think Flynn is an idiot that they can betray, but then he pulls the rug out from under Nate at the museum, sending Nate to jail. Chloe playing both sides creates a lot of drama since you never know what she's going to do at a moment's notice, and if Flynn is going to find out about the double cross, or worse, Lazarevich. Speaking of whom, I think this guy is the biggest reason why the story works so well in this game. I said that the villains of Uncharted 1 were just not compelling to watch, which did a disservice to the well-rounded heroes. Uncharted 2 has Flynn for Nate's rival, who may not be as competent as Drake, but is consistently one step ahead of you, which gives him an entertaining edge as a character that Eddie didn't have in the first game. But Lazarevich as a villain is great because he's pure evil. The kind of pure evil that he just casually says this. Genghis Khan, Hitler, Stalin. Paul Pot, they were all great men. He's ruthless in his pursuit of Shambhala, which makes him incredibly dangerous. The game sets up that he's bad news with just how the characters talk about him in a fearful manner, but then he backs it up with his first on-screen appearance being his murdering one of his men for stealing treasure. You don't want to cross this guy. Having a villain be so relentless and so powerful does wonders for the story because it creates an opposition you want to see the heroes overcome, but you have no idea how they're going to do it since Lazarevich has so many soldiers, guns, and tanks at his disposal. But then his irredeemably evil nature can be used to show what makes the heroes good. It's obvious in Uncharted that Nate kills a lot of people, but you're never supposed to think too hard about that since it's a lighthearted action game at the end of the day. But I commend Uncharted 2 for going out of its way to establish that Nate isn't trying to hurt anybody. He makes sure they don't bring guns to the museum heist because he doesn't want to kill museum guards for no reason. He just has a curiosity for ancient treasure and stuff like that. It's always the enemies of the game is attacking him first. This game shows that he wants to do the right thing like when he goes out of his way to try and save Jeff, Elena's cameraman, even though he's been shot. Leaving him behind would be what a cold-blooded person would do, as evidenced by Lazarevich finding them and killing Jeff himself. Did you carry him all the way from the temple? Shame. No! Now, tell me what you found in the temple. Another great example is when this scene where they find Shambhala and Nate uses one of Lazarevich's goons as a human shield. Not something Nate wants to do, but again, these guys are the aggressors. Lazarevich then just kills the guy because he's got no love for anything but power. Every time he's on screen, he turns the tables in seconds and takes all of Nate's bargaining power away when that's what Nate does best. Now, one we will use as a lesson, and the other we will use as incentive to cooperate. You choose. This is bullshit, Nate. Yeah, don't play into his game. You want my help, you let them go. This is not a negotiation! Who would you sacrifice, and who would you save? What, this one? You want to save this one? Or maybe this one? Hmm? You know what, enough of this shit. All right, quit the theatrics. I'll do what you want. This is what I was trying to illustrate in Uncharted 1, that having a really memorable bad guy further enriches the main cast and drives the plot in exciting ways. I love a pure evil bad guy because they're really fun to watch and Uncharted 2 nails that, leading to an exciting finale with several action set pieces like I said before. 
The introduction of more monstrous creatures, which I always had an easier time buying into in this game than the first one. Perhaps this is because this is the sequel, which made it so that I was expecting the supernatural, but I just like the way they paced it, and so you see this dramatic shot of the monster that Nate can't see adding more of that dramatic irony to the cave exploration. And then it's a tense bit of gameplay as you get a really weak gun against one of them. But then the biggest guns can barely touch the new enemies as they destroy Lazarevich's army. The first game set it up that something weird was killing people on the island, and then bam, zombies show up. It just felt jarring in a way where this one didn't. The stakes get higher when Elena takes a grenade from Flynn, and then Lazarevich gets the unlimited power from the tree, and then you get a final boss that's actually a boss fight this time, where the newly introduced sap explosion mechanic is made the final challenge, as it's the only thing you can use to defeat Lazarevich, as the day is saved and Elena is healed too, with Sully coming back for an ending cameo. Uh, which way did Chloe go? See you later. Oh no. <laughs> You're a dirty old man, Sullivan. Uh-huh. Wrapping up Uncharted 2. A game that I am quite pleased to say was every bit as good as I remembered. Uncharted 1 was a game I remembered being pretty good, and that's what I got. 2 I remember being an all-time great, a total blast to play, an action-packed thrill ride, and that's exactly what I got from it as well. Uncharted 2 Among Thieves is so good and was such a genre-defining action shooter that it's almost hard to appreciate just how impressive it was at the time of its release. The game came out just a couple months after the PS3 Slim released and was its flagship title, selling half a million copies in North America in the month of its release selling three and a half million units worldwide within just a couple months. Uncharted 2 sweeped awards for best game of 2009 in a plethora of other categories and got the reception it deserved. Near perfect scores across the board. Before Uncharted 2, no game had so effortlessly blended action shooting with the cinematic flair of a great summer blockbuster, telling a compelling story with funny and likable protagonists and equally despicable antagonists. It's a great game that improved upon its predecessor in every way imaginable and shattered expectations by going above and beyond that standard. I loved this game the moment I first played it 10 years ago, and I still do now, and I'm glad to say. Although I don't want to repeat myself too much, so I'll just get to the point. Next up is Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception, which was first released in 2011, and I will say this. Of all of Naughty Dog's PlayStation games, this is the one I remember the least. Barring Lost Legacy, which I've actually never played. But back on point, will I hate Uncharted 3? Will I love Uncharted 3? Will I be somewhere in the middle? Will it be the game of all time? I'm not sure at this moment, but that's why you gotta stay tuned for the next video to find out what I have to say about Uncharted 3. And in the meantime, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.